Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today is the end of my second week teaching verse by verse through the book of Philippians, and I'm now at the end of Philippians chapter 2. So I'm averaging about one uh, chapter per week, and there's four chapters in Philippians, so we've probably got two more weeks to go on this. I tell you, this has been powerful. I am just so thankful that the Lord led Paul to write these letters. Uh, not only does it give us insight into how we're supposed to live, but it gives us insight into Paul and how he was able to endure all of the persecution and the things that he went through and how he made such a big impact. He's really revealing his heart. The book of Philippians is a letter by Paul to his partners. I established that in the first five verses of Philippians chapter 1. And I've got this little book entitled Paul's Letter to His Partners. That's what this book of Philippians is. These are the people, the only people, that supported Paul after he left the local area. And so these people were really dear unto him. And he just opened his heart and he reveals some things in this book of Philippians that he didn't reveal in other places. And so this is just, this is a powerful uh, passage of Scripture that really reveals the heart of a man who was used by God maybe as much as any person who's ever lived. And what a great thing. So anyway, without going into all of the detail, let me just say once again, I'm using this computer because I've got my living commentary where I've written so many notes on this and I have references that instead of having to turn to each one of them, I can just look at here and put my cursor on there and it'll bring these references up. I can look at the Greek and the Hebrew words that are right here in the text. And this is a powerful tool. If you haven't gotten my living commentary, Boy, you ought to get it. In my estimation, this is the number one uh, asset that I have is all of this revelation that God has given me. I've written footnotes on over 27,000 verses out of the 31,000 verses in the Bible. So this is a great deal. So we're in Philippians chapter 2. Paul was talking about how that he was going to send Timothy unto them as soon as he learned what happened to him. He was in prison and he was going before Nero and he was going to have sentence placed on him. Either he was going to be set free or possibly he was going to be executed. And he knew that these Philippians wanted to know what was happening. So he was going to send Timothy once he knew the whole situation. But prior to that, he was sending a man. And again, I struggle to pronounce this guy's name, so I'm not even going to uh, try and pronounce it. But he was a Philippian a person from Philippi that the Philippians had sent to convey the money, the uh, uh, things that they sent to Paul. Paul mentions in the fourth chapter the parchments and some clothing that they sent him. But they also helped support him so that he was able to live in a hired house for two years while he was in Rome instead of being in the prison system uh, proper. And so uh, this man was sent from the Philippians to help Paul, but he had gotten sick and he was near unto death is what Paul said. And so because of that, Paul didn't want to wait until he got the final verdict about what Nero was going to do. He was going to send this Philippian, this man back to the people that he knew. He was one of them. And he was doing it because they had also heard that he had been sick and he was close to death, but the Lord healed him. And so Paul was sending this man back to Philippi to give a report, a preliminary report, but also because he knew that these people loved him so much that they would be blessed by seeing him come. And so here again, I pointed this out on yesterday's program, but here's Paul in prison thinking about his partners, the people who had supported him and had enabled him to do much of the things that he had done. And he was thinking about them instead of just thinking about himself. Here he was in prison and suffering and facing possible execution. But instead of just thinking about himself and what he was going through, he was thinking about his partners. Boy, this speaks volumes about Paul. And it also speaks volumes about how we should be. This is the heart of Jesus. And this is what he'd been talking about in this second chapter, that we need to esteem others better than ourselves. We need to look on other people's things and not just on our own things. And then he used Jesus as an example the greatest example of a person who literally gave his life and sacrificed everything for the sake of other people. 
And so here's Paul modeling this once again by sending this person who was ministering to him and that he could have retained him. And it would have been of great benefit to Paul to have this man stay with him. But because he loved the Philippians, he sent this man back with a preliminary report because he knew that that would bless the Philippians to see that this uh, brother of theirs was healed and healthy. And so Paul was thinking of other people ahead of himself. Man, that is just powerful. So in verse 28, he says, I sent him therefore the more carefully that when you see him again, you may rejoice and that I may be less sorrowful. This is not saying that Paul was a beat down, depressed, discouraged person, but it did grieve him to know that the Philippians had sent this man to minister in their stead to Paul, that he had gotten sick, nearly died, and Paul knew that these Philippians would be wondering about what happened to him. Did he survive? And so Paul was sorry, sorrowful, not because he was depressed or anything like that, but he was compassionate towards these Philippians, and he knew that they would be concerned, and that grieved him. And so he wanted to send this man back, not only for their benefit, but for his benefit, because he would rejoice at their rejoicing. Again, showing you a person who is living outside of himself, not just living for himself. Man, I admire that so much. That's what I'm trying to do is to live for God and for other people. Did you know today we just, we got all of our priorities wrong. Look at this in verse 29. It says, Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation. Now they're talking about this man who was sent by the Philippians to minister to Paul, to bring him money, clothes, things like that, and also to serve him and be there. And Paul is saying, Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation. Paul is saying that we need to honor people like this. And yet our society today is so perverse. Man, we glorify these movie stars, which I'm not against any movie star. I'm not against an athlete. An athlete. I'm not against anybody, but I am against the way that we glorify these people and put them on our magazine covers and we put them on television and people just idolize them and they have no character, no integrity. They aren't living for anybody but themselves. They are just drawing all of the attention, all of the glory for themselves. This is the reason they can't hold a marriage together, the reason they have to go on dope to be able to survive and to cope. I'm not against them personally. I pray that they get born again, but I am against the way that even Christians glorify these people. You know, I never watch these television programs, but I see ads about uh, American Idol, the mass singer, some kind of a dancing thing, and they are just putting these people out there and people are screaming and yelling and everybody wants to be like them. And yet they're just evaluating them based on some talent that they have, not based on any character. You could take the vast majority, you could take 95% of the people who are the movers and the shakers, the people that are being idolized and loved by all of the general public, even many Christians, And if you took all of them together and put their integrity in a thimble, it wouldn't even fit. It wouldn't even overflow a thimble. That's how little integrity they have. They're immoral people. They aren't living godly. They will operate in strife. They shack up, live with anybody and everybody. And yet these are the ones that even Christians are idolizing. I tell you, that's wrong. This says that we should hold people in reputation who have put their life at stake for the gospel, for ministering to other people. I tell you, when we stand before God, God is going to evaluate things much, much, much differently than the way we have evaluated things here on this earth. Some of these people who are just so famous and so idolized and they're beautiful and they show off all of their body and the more that they show, the more famous they become. And stuff. I guarantee you when they stand before God, it's going to be a different thing. And we're going to see some people that never got any recognition in this world system. We'll see some housewives that maybe did nothing but raise their kids and just be a blessing to their husband. And they were involved in their church and did what they could do. 
But I can guarantee you they're going to shine brightly because those people laid their life down and put their career on hold because they love their family more than they love themselves. We're going to see some people that never gained attention in this world system that are going to shine bright in eternity. These are the people that we need to be putting in reputation. You know, our Truth and Liberty Coalition that we have with Richard Harris, he directs that for me. We've started an awards banquet, and last year we recognized Jack Phillips, the baker in Denver, Colorado, who refused to make a cake for a homosexual uh, couple. And he was willing to do other things. He was even willing to send them to another baker who would accommodate them. He never treated them badly. He made other things for this exact same couple, but he just refused to violate his own conscience and because of it, he has been sued and harassed. He's gone all the way to the Supreme Court, and he won the battle, and yet there is a lawyer in Denver who has just said, I am going to make your life miserable. And he keeps suing him, and he's now back in court. He's been at this, I don't even know how much time. It's close to 10 years, I think, and Jack Phillips and his wife have endured things. And so we honored them with an award and just thank them. I believe people like that, that in the world system, they aren't going to be the ones who get all of the credit. But in God's eyes, man, God honors them, and we should honor them. It says over in 1 Samuel chapter 2, I believe it's verse 30, it says, Those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. This was God speaking. And God honors people that honor Him. And people that don't honor Him, some of these movie stars, some of these athletes, some of these famous people, the singers and stuff that are just, I mean, anti-God and they are living for themselves and promoting themselves. God doesn't honor them and we shouldn't be honoring them. I'm not against those people. I'm not praying that they fail, but I am also not going to give them honor just because they're beautiful, just because they can sing, just because they can kick or throw a ball or something like that. That doesn't impress me. People's heart is what impresses me, just like Paul was talking right here about Timothy, a man that was like-minded with him and that would naturally care for the estate of others. Those are the people that he honored. And this man who was a representative of the Philippians and he had put his life at risk. He said because of, the, uh, of his service, because he had sacrificed himself, he, he was having physical problems and close unto death because he had dedicated himself to serving the Apostle Paul. Those are the ones that Paul said we should hold in reputation. In verse 30, because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service, towards me. That's the reason that this man was nearly dying because he had just depleted himself and made himself vulnerable and was close unto death. And Paul said, we should hold people like that in reputation. Man, that's awesome. Again, I hope that you don't misunderstand me. I'm not against people. I don't hate anybody, but I do not follow the path of this world where they just put all of this honor and all of this respect on people because they're beautiful or because they can strip more than other people or because they can throw or kick a ball or because they can sing or something. Those things are not near as attractive to me as a person's heart. And I see people with a right heart who are willing to serve. You know, we've got people in our Bible school We've got people that just serve and serve and serve. I've got people that have been with me for decades. I was talking to one lady during lunch today who's been with me for 26 years, and she just works in our production, and she fills orders, but she has been faithful, 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 faithful. I tell you what, people like that are the ones that we need to hold in reputation, and you'll probably never hear about this lady but I guarantee you in God's book, she's more important than a lot of these people that the world is giving honor to. So going into chapter 3 in verse 1, it says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. You know, let me just point out that Paul said, Finally, my brethren, and then he wrote two more chapters. He wrote 50% of this whole book after he said, Finally. So <laughs> this is kind of a precedent for preachers to say, Well, 
finally, and then they go ahead and preach another 30 minutes. I heard one preacher get up and he says, I, I'm just about through. How many will give me five more minutes? And people start holding their hands up and he goes, all right, there's five, 10, 15, 20. <laughs> and he used that as an excuse for him just preaching. It's hard to quit when, man, you're talking about the Lord and about the goodness of God and how he can change your life. These things that are not being said in our culture today, it, there's just so much to say. It's hard to quit. And so here's Paul saying, finally, and then he writes 50% of this letter and uh, just keeps uh, in, in expounding on it. He said, to write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. You know, this is one of the problems that I've experienced as a minister. I know a lot of my minister peers, they go through this. They feel like they always have to have something brand new. And yet I guarantee you, we need to be just preaching the simplicity, the foundational things of the Word because most people hadn't even got those things in place. I heard a story about a man who went and auditioned to be a pastor of a church. And so he went to the church and he preached a message on John 3, 16. And it was powerful and people loved it. And so they voted him in as pastor. And then his first Sunday as a pastor, he preached on John 3, 16 again. And people thought that was strange. And they thought, well, he must have forgot what he preached when he was just here auditioning. So they didn't say anything. And then the second week as their pastor, he preached the same message again, John 3, 16. And this really began to bother people, but they didn't say anything. The third week, he preached the exact same message. And finally, it got to where it was bothering people. They went to the elders. The elders went to him and said, Pastor, you have preached the same message four times in a row. Don't you know anything else? And he told them, he says, when you start living what I've already preached, then I'll preach something different. Now that's powerful. If we only preached uh, something new once the people that were listening to us got hold and started putting into practice the things that we taught, I guarantee you we wouldn't have to have very many messages. Most people just, they have itching ears. They want to hear something new all of the time. But Paul is saying it's needful for you that I preach the same things over. Some of the things that I said when I was with you, I'm going to remind you of them because you need to hear them. It's not... It's not grievous to him. He, he had come to a place that he wasn't out to just come up with something new and always have people come up and say, oh man, that was a great revelation. He wasn't in it for himself. He was in it for the people and he realized that you have to repeat things over and over and over in order for people to get it. You know, my mother was an educator and I remember her saying this when I was young. She said that the average person has to hear something seven times before it is totally registered and non, uh, you know, erasable in their heart. Seven times things have to be repeated. And I've always uh, kind of gone by that. I don't know where they came up with that, but she was taught that in the education field. And I do know that people need to have things repeated. So I just minister the same stuff over and over. You know, I've ministered the same message thousands of times. And I've heard it, and yet I get blessed every time I hear it. This is one of the ways that you write it upon your heart. I think it's in Proverbs chapter 3. It says, write these things upon your heart. And then you go over to Psalms. It says that my tongue is a pen of a ready writer. You know how you write things on your heart? You speak it. And when I preach the Word of God and I proclaim things, man, it's coming back to me and I'm writing these things on my heart. I've heard things thousands of times and it's one of the ways that I get established in the Word of God is by getting up and preaching it and sharing it. So if it does me good, well, then I, it'll do you good. You need to hear the same things over and over. The Word of God is unique. It's not like any other book in the sense that, you know, you can read a novel, you can read a history book, uh, something like that, and you might read it once or twice and get benefit out of it. But if you read it a hundred times, it's just, you know, you've already gotten everything that there is. But the Bible isn't like that. The Bible has depth to it that I can guarantee. I have read some of these verses. I've read the Bible hundreds of times. I've studied, who knows, millions of hours that I've put in study, and yet I am getting more revelation, deeper things from the Scripture than I've ever gotten because there's just these multiple layers. This is one of the complaints 
that I have against some of the modern translations, that in an effort to make the Word of God simple so that people can understand it, what they do, they make a shallow interpretation. They just give you a surface level understanding of what's being said. And that may have some benefit to it to people that are brand new, but you can't study some of these modern translations and get the same depth out of it that you get from like the King James Bible. I know that I have a lot of people criticize me over the fact that I use the King James Bible. I'm not one of these guys that's a King James only Bible person. And if you use something else, you're of the devil. I don't say that. I refer to other translations. I look at them. But the but a King James really is written in a style that sometimes you have to think about it. You have to look up some of these words because they aren't words that we typically use today. And, and as you study it, you get a depth of understanding that you don't get from some of these modern translations that just hit the surface level understanding. The Word of God is powerful. So again, you need to be hearing the same thing over and over. You need to study the Word over and over and over. The second verse says, Beware of dogs. This is the things he's writing to him. And he says, Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Now, I'm just about out of time today, but let me give you a, a, a story that when I first got turned on to the Lord, I started knocking on a hundred doors a day. And I made a mistake of going to the richest part of town, which, you know, the scripture says that the poor heard Jesus gladly. And I didn't understand that. And I was knocking on these rich people's door and boy, they wouldn't give me the time of the day. They were slamming the door in my face. And I just determined one day that I was going to get this next person to talk to me if I had to stick my foot in the door, whatever. And so I went up there saying, oh God, give me something. And, and when I knocked on the door, the woman opened the door and she had a chain on it and only opened it just a, you know, a little bit. And she was looking out and she said, what do you want? And I said, praise God, I finally found a Christian. And she goes, what makes you think I'm a Christian? And I said, you got this scripture written on your fence. And this woman said, scripture. And she unbolted the door and stepped out on the porch. And she says, where? And I turned over here to Philippians chapter three, verse two. And it says right here, beware of dogs. And I read nearly the entire third chapter of Philippians before this woman walked off and shut the door. <laughs> I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel and the programs that we have available. And I want to encourage you that you can get the materials that we've offered. Also, I'd like to encourage you to like our program and subscribe to what we're doing. We have a lot of material and I believe it'll be a real blessing to you. So thank you for being a part of it. God bless you.